Hi, listeners. Welcome to Ashoka Podcast, which is called Why Should I Care? And today we have another guest. Jeremy Drucker is with us. Um, Jeremy is our only Brooklyn-born Czech fellow. Hi, Jeremy. That's right. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's great to have you here. So in this podcast, we actually give people a, like a glimpse of the world where solutions outnumber the problems. But I would like to start with um, one problem, which is news fatigue. Could you say what that is, please? Sure. Uh, this is also known as news aversion. And it basically means that people are so tired of the news for a variety of reasons that they start tuning out or turning off. So they basically either selectively avoid certain topics or just avoid the news altogether. This is obviously not a good thing uh, for any democracy or kind of any society if people are just tuning out because people who tune out tend not to be very engaged with what's going on or civically active or, or any of that. And these numbers have been going up globally uh, for the last couple of years. And I think it's at about 32% now for a lot of places. And that's up I don't know, six, seven, eight percentage points in the last five years. So this is a serious problem and it's getting worse. Okay, so why should we care about it? Like, you know, in Middle Ages, people didn't know all those things and somehow they lived. Why, why should I care about it? Yeah, well, I think partly what I what I said before, just about engaging. And if people are not interested in the news, particularly certain topics, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't want to read any more news about Ukraine before it was COVID. So they're not keeping informed. They're not going to push for change. They're not going to at all be engaged with what's happening in their local communities. So I think that's pure and simple. I, the research has shown that people that are fatigued from the news, people who are depressed, They feel powerlessness and like they can't do anything and basically tune out from society. So I think we should all care about that because we hope people will be, especially in democracies, more participatory, more active, pushing politicians to make change. But if they don't even know what's going on, it's very difficult to do that. Okay, so I should care about it because um, in democracy, if I don't like something, I cannot do to change myself so I it's in my interest so that other people are worried about something or they disagree with something because then if our opinions align we can together try and change something in frames of the democratic tools is that it yeah yeah I think you put that well uh, generally again like if people are engaged around a certain topic or theme They're going to look around for like-minded people and and then either launch civic act, uh, activism themselves or activities or initiatives or maybe even form a political party or a movement or something like that. But again, if people don't know what's going on in the world, if they're just sitting at home, they don't want to turn on the computer, or turn on the TV, turn on the radio, they're probably not going to be pushing for change. They're probably going to be wallowing in despair and at home and not wanting to go out in the world and, and even try to make a change because they feel it has no sense. Everything is going in a, in a bad direction. So why should I get involved? Why should I care? And if they don't do that, what could happen? Well, I think eventually if these figures still keep going up and up, I think we're going to have only a certain group of people that are civically active, which again cuts off a lot of uh, diverse viewpoints, a lot of other ways of solving problems. Could be a lot of young people who are very creative. They can think up change, but if they also are so depressed about what they're reading and what they're experiencing, uh, they're also going to just not get involved. So I think there'll be a lot of wasted opportunities of different creative solutions that people might have to problems, but they're so depressed and so uninvolved that those Solutions never see the light of day. This is a bigger question about journalism because it's not just about news aversion, but about representation and people seeing journalists like them, that look like them, that talk like them, that cover their problems. It's gotten better over the last couple of years, but there's still a lot of black holes out there where diversity is a huge issue. So again, 
if people are, don't feel like they're represented in the media, they feel like the media only talks about what's what's bad in their particular groups, uh, this is also a, a huge problem. I totally understand why news fatigue is important for me personally. What are you doing about it? So my organization is a training organization, and we also publish an online magazine about Central and Eastern Europe. So we've gotten very involved in, say, the last six or seven years in something called solutions journalism. And solutions journalism, people have always done it, but a big movement to kind of change the landscape of the journalistic profession started almost exactly 10 years ago in the U.S. and has been spreading around the world. And We've been, I hope, doing a lot to spread it in Central and Eastern Europe. And not surprisingly, if you hear the name, the goal is to not only cover what's wrong in the world, but actually what's going right. So this is to counter the news fatigue. So people actually have some sense of power of being civically active, that they see similar examples in the past that have worked and change is possible. There is some positive stuff going on in the world after all. It's not all negative. So we've really been trying to convince journalists to take a step back, look at the type of reporting they've been doing, focusing almost exclusively on problems, and to to take another approach and, and really try to figure out who's doing it right. That's the key question we're, we're always asking with solutions journalism. Who's doing it right? And then to really investigate. Is it is it having impact? What are the limitations? How's it being done with the hope that others can emulate these successes in, in other places? I think this is super important what you just said is that solutions journalism is not just um, talking about good things. So it's not just rainbows and unicorns, but it's really investigating the solutions, like making sure that this is not just, oh, don't worry, there are some good ha things happening in the world as well, but it's really trying to see how this works and and doing the the same journalist thing mm -hmm. just with the solution not with the problem right yeah and a lot of people get confused by that they think it's like a fireman saving a kitten up in the tree and good news and happy news and all um, a lot of people also think it's advocacy that these journalists are picking a particular solution maybe it would be implemented by uh, a friend at an NGO uh, that they that they know um, but it's not it's not advocacy it's it's really I often like to think of it as investigative journalism with the same fairness that you're providing uh, except it's investigating a solution and not a problem uh, but you still have the same journalistic standards you talk to people you really try to figure out does this solution have real impact as well we also have started to say the, the word response a lot more because solutions it tends to talk about complete solutions, things that are always working, these kind of grand solutions to the world problems, the world's problems. But we're really talking about effective responses that are working today. They might not work 10 years from now, but they're they're working now. And they're things that people can investigate and, and then others can hopefully copy them or adapt them to their own communities. Can you give an example of the, of, of a an article or a material material that was created around um, a problem and some responses that you find especially interesting yeah, or well, appealing? Since we're in Poland, I remember clearly a story that we ran probably about two years ago, um, which was tackling the fact that a lot of people with Down syndrome are in institutions or isolated at home and are not in a part of local communities. And there's actually a theater in Gdansk, uh, you probably know about it. Um, and there they have people with Down syndrome who are actually working as ushers and yes. helping seat people and really engaging with the local community, which is beneficial to both sides, right? So the, the people with Down syndrome are not just sitting at home, but they're engaging, they're doing something worthwhile, but also they are meeting people uh, who have never met people uh, with Down syndrome before and seeing that they can also be a vibrant part of the community. That particular solution, from what I remember, was being implemented in, in Germany. And the director of the, the theater in Gdansk was visiting and saw it in Germany and thought, this is a great idea. 
I guess he did some investigation of his own, how it would work, and then adapted it back in Gdansk. So, so I think that's a really nice example. It's something um, the the author interviewed uh, people involved, and it it's something which could be adapted by other people. Um, so there, there are really hundreds, thousands of examples like that, those Where kind of civic them? initiatives. Where do you find them? Can our listeners find them somewhere? Yeah, well, I mean, these types of stories, I should mention, uh, there is something called the Solutions Journalism Tracker, which is a huge database of solution stories, which is run by the Solutions Journalism Network. I think last time I looked, there were something like 14,000 curated solution stories there. So that's a great place to look for inspiration. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it's a lot of times things that we see happening in our own communities. Journalists can find them sometimes. Sometimes they're coming out of innovation, um, uh, innovators and, and things like that. So it could be just walking to uh, your office on a day and you see some kind of interesting civic initiative. It could be a restaurant that employs people with disabilities. It could be anything like that. Um, a lot of times they are civic initiatives or work by NGOs, but also government programs do work sometimes and are, are worth profiling also. So I think they're they're all around us. It's just until now, a lot of people have not really been looking for them or thinking they were worthwhile, worthy subjects to to write about. Um, they focused only on problems, and we as journalists are often taught that we're supposed to be the watchdogs of democracy, uncover crime and corruption, and all of that. So a little bit, it's it's also how we've all been educated. So we're trying to to change that approach and and have people look look beyond that. And do we, okay, so if you say that this is a solution or a response to um, news fatigue, do you have any data that shows that this works and people prefer yeah. this kind of information? I don't have it in my pocket right now, but there's <laughs> plenty of research that's being done, uh, both uh, commissioned by the Solutions Journalism Network. We're actually also commissioning some research. The preliminary results should be ready by the end of the year, looking particularly at Central and Eastern Europe. But there's a lot of research out there uh, that that can be accessed on SJN, Solution Journalism Network's site, which does show that people who consume solution journalism or are more likely to get involved in that particular issue, to stay interested in that issue, to share stories related to that issue, um, and, and even just to read to the end of the article. Uh, people tend to really consume this and say they want more of it. Of course, there's still going to be clickbait out there. There's going to be stories about celebrities and crime and corruption uh, that might get a lot of views also. But it does seem to be a hunger when people are asked in surveys and just anecdotally, people just say, I'm tired of just reading about what's going wrong in the world and I want to be inspired. And, and again, the research shows people stand, tend to be more involved in the issue from then on. We know what you're doing. We know what the problem is about and why we should care. So if you think of our listeners, not all of them are journalists. Obviously, if some of you are, please have a look at the Solutions Journalism Network website. But what can an, an average normal person do about it? I think a normal person can really demand more. Uh, I think we know how businesses work, right? I mean, we're, we're a nonprofit. We think this is important. We have donors that believe in our mission, but commercial organizations that reach a lot more people than we do, they're gonna keep doing the same thing over and over again, unless readers really demand change. It could be simply not buying the paper anymore, but I think that's not a good thing because as we saw, as we talked about before, we want people to stay engaged, not to stop consuming media. But they should really be demanding, whether it's a letter to the editor or calling up an editorial office, whatever it might be, supporting this kind of journalism. Because I think as, as more people in powerful positions see that this is the way to go, that is leading to more reader engagement, more subscriptions, more ad pages clicked on the, on the internet, it's going to be adopted even more. So I think a lot of us understand it's the right thing to do, but we still have to show on a much larger scale that it's commercially viable and makes also business sense. There's a lot of research that's heading in that direction. We're still pretty early though. This is only a decade really into spreading this concept. So 
there's some some good examples in the U.S., some in Western Europe, and now we're trying to also map them in in Central and Eastern Europe. But there are some great examples out there. Uh, I mean, just one since we talked a little bit uh, about Ukraine and news avoidance related to Ukraine. There's a great solutions journalism outlet in Ukraine, which is called Rubrica. And they've really shown, I think they have something like 2 million visits a month now. Um, so uh, they're showing it's part of their model and that people will read it and consume it even in a really difficult climate that is Ukraine today. So we just have to keep spreading the model and then mapping out the examples of, of it leading to better business results. Because I think that's ultimately the way to start changing the profession as a whole. Thank you. That was really interesting. So listeners, now you know what you're supposed to do. If you care about news fatigue and you want um, more solutions journalism, then you need to show your editors or your media outlets that this is what you want and what you need. And this was Oh, Why Should I Care podcast with Jeremy Drucker, our Ashoka fellow from Czech Republic. I'm Agata Stafi Bartosik. This podcast is produced by Anna Schlusarenka and the fact checking and all the wonderful links that you will find in the description of the podcast are provided by Anita Govatska. Thank you. Mm-hmm.